This video is sponsored by Texas Instruments as part of a campaign they're running called A Day Without Power Management to raise awareness of their range of power management integrated circuits. And as part of that, they've approached a few vloggers and said, how would you fare? If the power went off one day, uh, how would you manage? And the answer is that when you live in an island in the middle of the Irish Sea, you're kind of well used to that, which is why I've got LED headlights, I've got power banks, other lights, lots of rechargeable lights, and I should mention that right at the moment, Hurricane Ophelia is passing. Outside is just an absolute apocalypse. You may actually hear it during the video, the creaking noises and, uh, and the wind storming by. And, well, one of the most prominent noises at the moment is flurries of leaves and foliage just smashing off the windows. Exciting. So um, the power may also go off in the middle of this video because being a rural island, all the power is overhead. So it might actually turn into a real power outage situation. If that happens, all I'll do is pause the video, get some battery powered lighting up, and we'll continue the video with battery powered lighting. That's if it happens, and I'm sure that Hurricane Ophelia is probably gonna have a good go at that. But anyway, moving on. How would I fare without power? And the first thing, the most comforting thing for me when you lose power is a head torch, an LED head torch, not one that's going to try and light the entire universe with one billion lumens, but one that's got sensible settings that the rechargeable cells inside are going to last for a good length of time. This is a generic um, unit that's not branded in anything, but it's very, very good and they're very affordable and available these days and that's a good thing. Other useful things are lights aimed at the camp camp camping industry. And this one, uh, has multiple intensity settings and pulsive modulation, which uh, is why it's got candy stripes whizzing down to the moment in the camera due to the rolling shutter effect. It's very useful little light. It's actually got quite a large cell inside it and it's fully rechargeable. This is good. Uh, you'll find that a lot of people who live on the Isle of Man, as I do, um, they have LED flashlights in their pocket all the time because it's such a dark place at night. Power banks, these are generally stuffed with varying numbers of 18650 lithium cells and they can be used for powering so much. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in the past is that if you've not got enough power banks handy and there's a long power outage, which fortunately there aren't here on the Isle of Man, it's not too bad. They usually get the infrastructure back up quite quickly. Uh, having something to recharge your phone is important because you really miss your phone. You miss the connectivity of the internet when it's down and the ability to communicate. The other things that I miss are heat, not in the sense of heating the house because I'm very much an outdoor worker, so I keep a cool house. Uh, I like a dry house, so dehumidifiers, uh, I'd miss their, their activity. But the one thing I'd really miss is the ability to heat food and drink quickly. Um, and the fact that when you go up to the sink, it's not going to be hot water. It's electrically heated water at the sink. So that would uh, suddenly uh, be cold water, which is not so nice. But uh, other than that, you know, island life, you get used to the odd power outage and it's fine. So um, now that we've discussed that, let's take a look at the subject of this video, which is power management. Now, power management relates to, I'll just put these things out the way here. Power management relates to integrated circuits that are used in the control of power. It could be switch mode driver chips, it could be power factor correction chips. Quite an interesting subject. Now, we're going to be covering this one. I've actually been raking through Texas Instruments uh, website looking for data sheets. They've got some weird and wonderful chips. Very interesting. And of course, I have chosen the weird ones. That's just what I do, isn't it? So the first one I'm going to look at here is a power factor correction controller, because this is actually quite a fascinating subject. It's not a subject that's everybody's cup of tea, but it's a really important subject. You see, when you, uh, let's get the paperwork sorted out here. Let's get the paperwork sorted out. I've uh, scaled up the schematic down here so that we can actually take a look at it and see what's actually happening on it. You see, when you have a poor power factor, it causes problems. Now, let me describe what power factor is and it used to be so much easier. Uh, power factor is when you've got your voltage waveform and the current, if it was a normal, say, a resistive load like a heater or, or a traditional tungsten lamp, the current would match that perfectly. It, the two sine waves would just overlap and you wouldn't see much difference between them. That's called a unity power factor and it's the ideal. It makes it easy for the power distribution companies. It makes it easy for, well, so many ways. It, it's just an ideal situation. 
However, when you have, say for instance, uh, a huge inductive load like a transformer, then it introduces a phase shift to the current so that as the voltage goes up and down, the current does not match that. And this is one of the biggest problems that you used to have. Uh, it's all different now though. And uh, the mismatch of the waveforms, the voltage current waveform, the severity of it depends, gives the rating of the power factor. It could vary from one, it could go right down to say about 0.5 would be a pretty bad situation. Uh, but in the traditional old days, that was easy to fix. You just stuck a capacitor across it of a suitable value that shifted the, the current in the opposite direction. And that then brought the voltage and the current back into alignment. But that's much harder these days. You see, with modern power factor problems, we have uh, DC power supplies and everything. Where you've got a bridge rectifier, a very lazy bridge rectifier. I always draw lazy bridge rectifiers. So that's the AC going in. I also draw lazy sine waves, apparently. Uh, and we've got the DC coming out, the full wave rectified, and then it gets smoothed by a capacitor. And here's the thing. The circuitry that's powering off that capacitor, um, well, let me, draw, let me draw a full wave rectified sine wave. There we go. There's a full wave rectified sine wave. And there's the voltage that the capacitor pumps up to. It's just below the peak because the load is continually trying to pull it down. As it draws current, the voltage falls slightly across the capacitor. And as the, uh, the mains voltage reaches that uh, threshold, it will then charge capacitor back up. But unfortunately, that means that for this part of the sine wave, there's virtually no current being drawn. And then suddenly, when it reaches the voltage capacitor's at, a lot of current will flow. And you'll end up with a waveform that instead of being a nice sine wave, you end up with something that looks like this. Oh, that storm is so strong outside, it's getting quite exciting. And, you know, with small loads, if you've just got one or two appliances that are like that, then it's not a huge problem. But if you consider, if you've got a data center, which is just racks and racks and racks of computers with these, then the whole mains waveform to that data center is going to be this series of huge uh, current pulses in the middle and because the current is much higher than the sort of average required it means that a substation feeding this and well the electrical wiring within the building feeding this equipment now has to allow for the fact that instead of say let's let's exaggerate it instead of 10 amps it's going to be seeing pulses of 20 amps and then voltage drop across that cable becomes an issue and the transformers feeding it the power distribution company's transformers and the protection circuitry also has to allow for the fact that this current is being drawn as a series of uh, high spikes, and they have to allow for that in their transformers. So it makes it a lot more expensive for them to supply that equipment. And as such, they're likely to charge uh, companies that have very poor power factor. They can say, well, you know, you're going to bear part of the cost of this, and they can charge them more. And with the influx of smart meters into homes, this is also going to happen at homes uh, over time, particularly with electric car charging systems, the power companies will be able to just change the setting on your smart meters and it will start charging for the apparent power, which is what they, um, the sort of likelihood, the currents that they're seeing peaks of as opposed to the average power, the, the real power, and it means it will cost you more. So here's the solution to that. And this is just one example of the solution, and it's quite neat. You see... What this device does is it takes, it's got the bridge rectifier as before, a bit of filtering, and then just a low value capacitor. And then it's got an inductor here, a diode, which then feeds the main capacitor. That's the main capacitor there, and a switching transistor. And what it does is it boosts the voltage up. So now we've got our sine wave here, our rectified sine wave, and it actually aims for a voltage that's higher than the peak of the sine wave across the capacitor. And what that means is that uh, no current will flow, even at the peak of the sine wave, no current will directly flow through this inductor to charge up that, that capacitor. But this switching circuit then switches as a series of pulses throughout that sine wave, and those, uh, the peak of those pulses then are used to charge capacitor. So it is basically a series of pulses that are charged capacitor, but at quite a high frequency. And what the power equip equipment sees, the power distribution equipment and the utility companies see, Instead of seeing that horrible peak uh, in the middle of the sine wave, what they're seeing now is a slightly choppy but more sinusoidal 
output. I mean, that's the frequency is so high and there's so much filtering that, you know, effectively it's as good as a sine wave. It won't draw power at the, you know, close to the zero crossing point, but that occupies a, a very small part of that. So now, instead of this huge peak in the middle, the current is being drawn pretty much as the sine wave. And that solves a lot of problems. It means they can reduce cabling uh, specifications in data centers. It means that, you know, the local, the generator that backs up the data center can be smaller. It means the uh, substation equipment can be smaller. It just makes things so much better. So um, power factor correction, it's, it's quite a complex subject, it's, but it's a very interesting subject. And uh, Texas Instruments have a lot of chips for this, which is not really surprising because uh, it is quite a significant thing. You know, in industrial equipment, it's quite important to have that power factor correction. Moving on to uh, what you might call a more novel chip. This is a really interesting thing, the BQ25504, and it's an energy harvester chip. Now, the concept of energy harvesting is that if you have a very low current application and you want to just power it from whatever you can get, an energy harvester chip is designed to use solar power, wind power, vibrational power, geothermal power, anything that can generate, in this case, above about 0.3 volts is enough to kick this circuit into uh, action. And what it does, it takes that small voltage and it boosts it up to charge a battery. And uh, this thing is optimized for low current applications. I mean, it, you can scale up, it can drive higher current applications, but a typical example of this might be a remote uh, telemetry de type device that sends a signal back saying that some environmental thing has happened. You know, you want to monitor a remote location. This chip facilitates that. It's a sort of one stop shop for all those functions. And it doesn't just uh, charge the battery, but it lets you choose the type of battery chemistry. Say, for instance, if it was lithium ion, you want the upper voltage to be 4.2 volts and the lower voltage that it cuts off to be around about 3 volts. What you can actually do, you can set voltage thresholds with this, these high-value resistive dividers. And the, uh, you can set the upper battery voltage. So if you were using lithium, you set that to 4.2 volts or... If you want to choose the military specification of charging it to 3.9 volts, you could just set it to that instead. And the advantage of charging a lithium cell to just 3.9 volts as opposed to the 4.2 volts is that it puts a lot less stress in the cell. It's going to last a lot longer and it will potentially be able to be charged for hundreds of more, you know, hundreds of times the number of cycles, the recharge cycles. So that's a, a good advantage. It's nice you can program that. You can also use a capacitor in here if it's a very low current application or nickel metal hydride cells, anything you want because you can set those voltage parameters. You can also set a hysteresis level and a um, battery voltage OK level, whereby if the battery voltage is coming down too low, it will send a signal to the microcontroller that you've got doing your monitoring and say the battery is running low, it would be a good idea to shut down. And the microcontroller decides, okay, no problem. It might send one last message saying, you know, I'm shutting down because the power is low. It will shut down and only once the battery, again, a programmable, once it's written about, risen above a threshold, then it will enable that signal and, you know, the process will just wake up again. Very, very interesting stuff. I do like energy harvesting. It's, it's quite a fascinating subject. Um, one of the applications they have, the TI design notes, is TIDA-00998. I quite like this one because it involves blinking LEDs and it involves high voltage and power distribution. <clears throat> you see, this is a, a reference design for an overhead fault indicator. And when you have, and this is particularly relevant at the moment given what the storm's doing, when you have uh, power distribution lines out in fields and the lines are going between them, uh, and you can occasionally have some a broken insulator, you can occasionally have a, a rogue lightning arrestor that just occasionally shunts out, and, but you've got a long run and occasionally it keeps tripping the power. What you can actually do is you can hang devices that monitor for fault current and they don't have to be in every span. If it was over a large area, you could just put them 
one in the middle, one at each end. And what actually happens here is that when there's a fault, a fault, a short circuit, if you have a sudden pulse of current gets drawn at this one, it shunts to ground, then up to this point, you'll see a very high current of that fault current. And this device here is designed to detect the threshold. And when it does, it latches. And some of them just ping a wee flag down. Other ones uh, start, in this case, that it starts blinking LEDs. These ones, though, beyond the fault, will not see that high current. They'll just see the normal current flowing through, and they won't flag that up. So this design uses the energy harvester not just to, uh, well, it uses a um, current clamp around the cable to monitor that current, but it also harvests energy from that to charge the built-in battery. Um, and the design has a light sensor, so it's only really at, at below certain levels that it starts flashing uh, to show that the um, power has you know, been detected, a power anomaly has been detected. And it just lets uh, power companies narrow things down. But I do like this design, it's quite neat. As I say, lots of blinky LEDs, they've really gone to town the LEDs. This is good. The last chip I'm going to take a look at is just weird, but that's good. It's a four pin chip, and this chip is approximately this size. But a little dot, it's less than a millimeter square. How do you even put something like that in a circuit board? This is where pick and place comes quite handy. And it's called the LP5560. And this is designed to drive a single LED, and it's basically got four pins. The LED goes between the LED output and ground. It's got the VDD for the positive rail, and it's got a control line. And as standard, it comes out of the factory with a pattern programmed in for the LED. It, it limits the current through the LED, plus you can also control the current through the LED, including ramping it up and down. But the whole idea behind this, and it's really very clever, if you have a appliance that switches into standby, and you've got the little power button, and it's got an LED behind it, the main microcontroller can say to this, it can send a signal to this, it can send it, not just a signal, it can send a pattern, it can tell it what to do with the LED, and it can give it the pattern, it can say, off you go, and then the main con controller can shut down into standby mode. And at that point, this little tiny four-pin chip <coughs> then does whatever it was told to do. It could be, well, it's, it has the ability to not just flash on and off, but also change current ramps so it can ramp the intensity up and down. It can also pulse with modulate, so combining those, you can have uh, either just a flashing LED or you could have the LED just ramping up and down in that ever so fashionable style. But I like the fact that they've just crammed this into this tiny little four pin chip. It's one of those uh, ball grid array chips, so it's just got the little pads underneath it. It's quite neat. Uh, I, I like that. It's a, I spent a lot of time reading through this this particular data sheet just because it's such a weird application, but, but as I say, a useful one. So yeah, <clears throat> for entertainment, uh, it's worth taking a look at the data sheet section of Text Instruments site, particularly the power management, which is the subject at the moment the hot subject, uh, because they've got a lot of stuff. They have just a massive range of chips, and uh, the data sheets, oh, here's another thing. <clears throat> All Texas Instruments data sheets are very good in that. They basically have all the data you want and the basic data and then a schematic on the front of every one of the data sheets that I've downloaded so far. Let's dig through these. Let's find one of the other ones that's with the suitable schematic in the front. There it is. All the basic information you need and a schematic. That's a really common character in all their data sheets. And it's very useful. It means that for reference, you only need to just print off the top page uh, just for a, a sort of basically reference sheet for that chip. It's very handy. But yeah, it's worth taking a look at their website just to browse through their uh, data sheets and find if you can find even more weird ones than I've found. Um, but yeah, very interesting.